All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo Podcast, part of the Blue Wire Network. I'm your host, Patrick Moran. Thank you very much for following, whether it's on the video side or the audio side. Uh, coming up in a matter of seconds, literally, I'm going to be joined by my good buddy, Aaron Quinn, from Cover One. He is my regular Friday co-host uh, with this show. Real quick, because I know Aaron's not much of a hockey guy. I think his take will be that the Sabres suck. But anyway, uh, we're taping this early Thursday morning. I'm going to be pointing that out a couple times throughout this episode for obvious reasons. But the Buffalo Sabres did play last night, Wednesday night, and uh, lost to the Ottawa Senators 4-1. to one. They're on a seven-game losing streak. Um, they've done this two other times throughout this decade-long drought where they lost seven in a row and both times they ended up finishing dead last in the league don't think that's going to be the case this year but at any rate they're uh it's early man and they're in trouble 14 points good for only 14th in the eastern conference out of 16 teams it's only mid-november folks and when it comes to the playoff aspirations and hopes that you know felt realistic early on in the season those are getting buried already as well and too much Tage Thompson, who did score on Wednesday night, uh, Darlene Tuck, a little bit of Skinner. That, that's about it. There's just not much balance on this team um, to make matters worse. Goaltender Eric Comrie got hurt, injured his knee last night, so UPL is probably going to be brought up. Unlike the Bills, which, again, Aaron and I are going to talk about here in just a couple minutes. Um, no panic button with the Buffalo Bills, but when it comes to the Buffalo Sabres, it's panic time. And on that note, I am going to bring in my good buddy, Aaron Quinn, cover one. What's going on, what man? Up, How you doing? What's happening, my man? Uh, it's a crazy week, dude. Yeah. It's it, wild. It my wife's out of town. I'm stuck with these kids by myself, which shout out to single parents. Holy cow. What a lifestyle, man. They, my kids are driving me nuts. I don't know how anyone can do it. Uh, plus, Bill's mafia, like just unraveling in front of us on Twitter and anywhere you go on the internet. It's not safe right now for the Bill's fans. Yeah, it's... um. This has been a this has been a pretty crappy couple of weeks for Buffalo sports. Period. I, mean, yeah, I was going to say Sabers. You were, I just heard you talking about Sabers. That can't help. They're uh, yeah. The Bills are struggling, and we'll talk about that. The Sabers are uh, they're falling off. Okay, hey, look, so man. I want to learn right. more about hockey. How mm -hmm. significant losing seven games? Like how sig I just heard you talk about historical. They've only done that a few times. But is it like losing back to back games in the NFL, or it, is it like a three game losing streak in the it, NFL? It depends who you are. It depends who you are. I would say this with the, with the Buffalo Sabres lo typically losing, like being, you know, or even going pointless or, or winless, I should say in seven games. Cause unlike football and hockey, you could lose seven straight, but you could still pick up some points. You can take a game to overtime and you get a point. So, you know what I mean? It's not necessarily a, uh, a complete loss, but the Sabres are pointless in seven games. They've lost seven games in a row in regulation. In fact, they haven't had an overtime game this entire season, but anyway, typically I would say, it would be the equivalent of a, an average to decent team losing maybe two in a row, maybe three in a row. But in the case of the Sabres, who, you know, this is an annual thing right now, and, and they've been a bottom feeder, and, and they're trying to rise up the rankings in the hockey, this is bigger than just like a two or three game. This would be the equivalent of losing four or five in a row, I think, in football, where it's tough. And the, and the Bills, or I'm the Bills, the Sabres are in a tougher conference. The Eastern Conference is, is a packed conference. Kind of like the AFC was supposed to be coming into this year. Um, How the East looks? East looks pretty packed. Pretty you know, for playoff teams right now. Well, yeah, yeah, minus the AFC. I think we thought the AFC West would be like historically yeah. good this year. Yeah, we maybe were, the we East is wrong about that. Yeah, what the West could have been. But, but uh, yeah, the Sabres are, are they're getting buried in a tough conference and, yeah. and it's tough to jump a lot of teams and you know, That's how the like Western Conference for the NBA had been for a long time. Sure, yeah, Where, yeah. Like, it's a, a team yeah, that if they were in the East, they would have been playoff right. teams. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, it's mid-November, and it's like it, it's ridiculous to say, That's "Well, the, a team's out of it in mid-November." But you, the Sabers put it this way: the Sabers are not the kind of team that could lose seven games in a row right. and and just simply recover from that. So, uphill battle for them for sure. Um, like I said, we'll talk Buffalo Bills in a few we got minutes. Some Buffalo Bills news just came through. Not oh. anything cool. It's uh, Jonathan or King Kingsley Jonathan back to the practice squad. Uh, remember, they lost him. Uh, he was an undrafted free agent. They lost oh, yeah. him at one point to the Bears, I believe, yeah. after the waiver wire process. They've gotten him back. This is a great reminder, Pat, during when you go back in that period of time at the end of summer when everybody's freaking out 
about losing guys. These guys are all roster bubble guys for a reason, right? Yeah. Like they're probably going to be available to you again at some point. Yeah. You bring them back into your roster. Like it's never as big of a deal. Kingsley, it's, Kingsley, Jonathan is back for everybody that panicked <laughs> on Twitter. It, it is always fun to, uh, during the summertime when, when you're doing your roster projections to act like those, uh, French roster players are going to be so much more impactful because you know why? Once in a great big blue it's moon, hope. once in a, and once in a great big blue moon, one of those guys, not necessarily from the Bills, but from another team, Johnson. A French player. Yeah. I mean, they'll go on and become a really good player. Yeah. Uh, in the NFL, it's, it's scars from the drought era, though, where we needed that, right? You needed sure. an undrafted guy to get that roster spot and become that wide receiver that you needed. Now, like, there's just not space for it, right? Really, Anyways. um, I want I, I do want to say because this is dropping Friday, we are taping this early Thursday morning. The reason, well, there's a couple reasons why we tape um thursday mornings for the for this it's show. me i'm a diva I no, it's not it's it, this works out better for me too i work on thursday evenings i used to do the show with joe yard and it was really really difficult yeah. to be able to get it in um aaron because of parenting duties this is our our window to squeeze in and i think this works well for both of us and for the most part things don't really change too much when it comes to the podcast if we tape it in the morning or you know early afternoon or evening or during the evening i will say though this week so as we're taping this, it is uh it's about 9 30. You talk about the calm before the storm. This is definitely the calm right now. Um, there's no snow out whatsoever. No, um, but it's slight time dusting you're... this morning as I was walking the kid to school, just kind of in the air. There. There's just like snow in the air. You can you, it's coming, you can feel it. You live in the North Towns, yeah, which I, I get jealous of this time of year. I'm maybe the best decision I ever made in my life. Knock it, on wood. No, there's been exceptions. There are times where a snowstorm oh, will hit yeah. and, and you guys get it even worse. I live in the South Town, so I'm in like West Attica, right on the border of Orchard Park. Historically and generally, the South Town gets buried. You it's know, more like, the lake effect belt, right? The sure. snow belt. Right, right. More but at any rate, so we have nothing yet. By the time people are listening to this, hopefully on, you know, sometime Friday morning or early it's afternoon. Like partly sunny out, too. Might be a different story. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta work the next couple of nights. I'm, I'm I'm pretty. I typically do you like snowstorms. I I know that sounds like a, a stupid question, but there are people who I see it on Facebook. In fact, I've been on Facebook. Mostly, it's people who work from home who don't yeah. really have to go out much. They're like, "Give me all the snow. Give me seven <clears throat> feet of snow." No, nah, to ah. a point. I like storms to a point of like I'm a very cautious person. So anything that becomes like a hazardous situation, I really want no business uh, dealing right. with nature. I don't want to go up against nature. So the fact that I'm, I've only lived here now. This will be 10 years in December. We got here December 2011 or something like 20, mm -hmm. 2012. Uh, and all the years living here, there's been some big ones. And luckily where I've been has avoided it. But we've had to go help some of those people. The sure. November uh, storm, I had to get into an area that was blocked off by police that they were like, hey, you got to go in here at your own yeah. scratching. People were riding snowmobiles and to help people. And we had to get snow off of a friend's roof like that's serious. I want nothing to do with a storm like that where I have to worry about my family or anything that or flooding. If it starts to melt real quick, is it going to flood my basement? Stuff like that. So I'm to a point where, hey, if we're going to get two three feet of snow over the next two days love it i'm gonna crank some christmas music we're gonna watch some christmas movies i'm gonna <laughs> have a bunch of fun with my kids we're gonna throw on our snow stuff that's awesome sign me up for all that but i do think it becomes a point where it becomes a danger people die they go out and do stuff like that i don't want anything to do with that where elderly people are trapped in their houses and ambulances can't get to them and stuff like that that's all the things i want to avoid and that is the serious potential of some of the predictions and some of the mapping that we are seeing is if you're in the belt, wherever it ends up, like you have to be serious and you could be stuck there for a few days and traffic is going to be very difficult again in and out of where you are. So that's, I hope people just keep that in mind of, yeah, it's fun to watch the snow, but it, there's some serious consequences to major snow events. Um, yeah. Back in November, you know, I, I think I might've said this before. It's a, uh... One of a friend of mine, somebody who was at my wedding died from, yeah. from, I, didn't I think there was like 12, 12, 13 people who, who ended up dying from that storm. One of them, I'm not going to go into many details of his life, but his name was sure. Steve. He had a heart issue and he was shoveling outside in, in his yard. And he had a heart attack, you know, and, uh, 
Yeah. He, he died during that, that storm. So yeah, mm -hmm. man, you got to take the shit serious. It, it's fun to look out with, with the window, but if you got to go outside and you got to do stuff, you got to be, yep. uh, you gotta be really careful. You mentioned Christmas, uh, music and crank and stuff. Funny. You say that because, are you going to attack me because of a tweet I made? Or no, no, okay. no, 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 okay. no, no, no. I got attacked gonna... yesterday. What Did you? About... you... Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm attacking myself here. I. All right. So we've talked about this before. Generally speaking, I have always been team. Christmas starts the day after Thanksgiving. That's been my philosophy through most of my life. Okay. And now I'll watch Christmas movie. Actually, that's not true because until a year ago when I went on my Christmas movie binge, in part because of you. I was going to say, I think I'm partially responsible for you, you are. coming over to the dark side. Yeah, you are. For no question about it. But except for last year, I really don't get into Christmas movies much, but now I am. So I, I'm fine with cr watch Christmas movies, whatever you damn well feel like it. If it's fall, it's Christmas movie season. That's fine. However, I elevated it this week and I, I'm going to be completely honest with you. So again, in my entire life, two things in my entire life. A, I have never, ever had anything other than a real Christmas tree. Uh, are you real tree or, or artificial tree team? Oh, I'm all real tree, 100%. All right. I have always been real team or real tree. I've never had an artificial tree in my entire life. And we have also never put up a tree until after Thanksgiving. And typically, it's actually <clears throat> early December. It's even yeah. a little bit past uh, Thanksgiving before I put a tree up. Anyway, this week, that changed. You put a I tree went up to, already? I went to Hobby Lobby on Tuesday with my wife. And... That was a mistake. You should have stopped yes. that. You shouldn't even done that. Yep. Found, well, I was thinking about it already. You know what's funny? So every year I, I save my change, like my loose change. I go to the store, you know, I save my loose change, put them in a baggie and then it's a big cup. And every year I tell myself, I'm going to take this money and I'm going to buy a Christmas tree and, and get other stuff with it too. And every single year without fail, something comes up at some point where I got to cash that, that it, I need it for some yeah. kind of emergency something. So it never works this year for the first time, probably ever. I saved up my change. I ended up getting like 180 some dollars in change. Anyway. So we go to Hobby Lobby and I saw a really nice tree, artificial tree. It was on sale. It was like normally a $600 tree. And I got it for like 175 bucks. Long story short, bought the tree. And I was going to, you know, the plan was, all right, we'll get, we got the tree out of the way now, keep it in the box and, you know, put it up when we put it up. Well, I got impatient and <laughs> Tuesday night, my wife, who, by the way, does all the physical labor. I'm that guy. I'm the supervisor who just sits around, does nothing yeah. while my wife or my kids or whatever will do all the work. And, you know, I, I'm the one who's like, no, I'll put this there or make sure that's there. Anyway, that's me in a nutshell. Long story short, open up the box put the tree together and it's only uh I, I, if you're watching this on youtube i got a a little a little picture of it now by the way yeah, it doesn't yeah, do any nice justice oh no, the tree is nice it looks yeah. and by the way this is not one of those like i said cheap artificial trees not all artificial trees are created equal none of them are real sure. but some yeah. look more genuine than others this is a a good looking tree but anyway yeah. i just felt empty dude i'm sitting there tuesday night it was anti-climatic it, yeah. it felt not authentic. It did not feel genuine. It didn't feel That's Christmassy. You're nailing it. You're it just felt it. like I wasted a boring ass week now because I was bored and the storm was coming and I wanted to get the shit up and I, and I bullied my wife and, and, and Shane into uh, helping with the decorations. Christmas Here's... is up now in my house and it's not even just a tree. Like the garlands up. All yeah. my Christmas shit brought up from the basement. There's nothing wrong with the decorations being up. Here's our is our, we're pretty strict. I have like spreadsheets of how Christmas goes. I, I freaking love Christmas. <laughs> Pat, I really do. It's the best. Uh, and so how we do it, and I think it's the best way to do all of it is uh, we I start to slowly. I just got out of my cast yesterday. I'm in a splint so I can start to put up decorations. But usually I get my lights mm -hmm. out right in that first November 1st through whatever fifth, those first few days. And I get the lights up outside and start to get that decoration going and then slowly start to get the interior stuff done uh bring it up slowly you know um prepare for elf on the shelf 
festivities that are coming with kids and things like that. The tree does not happen until the day after Thanksgiving. Yeah. We don't do Black Friday shopping. Black Friday is kind of dead anyway. I know some people enjoy it, but we we go out. We take the family out. We go up to wherever in Lockport or whatever out mm-hmm. in the country and we get all bundled up and we get hot chocolates and there's an experience about that. We're listening to Christmas music the whole way. Everybody's jazz. The kids are fighting us like it's very Christmassy. It feels like authentic Christmas movie and you go and you pick out a tree with your family and it's just there's an experience. There's smells. There's the warmth of going into the shop and the pain in the ass of getting that tree up on your car and the sap and the getting it down and all that pain in the ass that goes with it. And you're freezing cold and your hands are stiff. You got to clean up all the needles, but then you get it all up mm-hmm. and it's Christmas and it's yeah. just, and, and, and it just feels Christmas and it smells Christmas. And that experience of the day is worth it a hundred fold to me. And those trees are expensive for what you actually get. They're like crap trees that are dried out. You're going to have to deal with it later. You're going to throw it out yourself. You're paying for the experience of the day in Christmas. And I do feel like people are welcome to have it to celebrate Christmas however they want. If you're just doing only a fake tree, I think you miss a big experience, which makes up part of the Christmas season. It's why the season is fantastic. There's so many good traditions just baked in through a two month period. I agree 100 percent. We have we've had a tradition where we go to the same place every year and get the, mm-hmm. not the same tree, but the, the same type yeah, yeah. of tree. Walk it just, yeah, man. Look, where I, you guys I, go, we go to Timbers. There's a place in Blaisdell nursery in, in, in Blaisdell on South Park Avenue. We went there for years and literally from the time Shane was a baby and I was, you know, he's a grown ass man. He's way bigger than I am, yeah, right. but uh, it's a, uh, it, it was a tradition. And I said, you know what? I don't know why I, I just allowed my mind to get poisoned this week because I was even going through like, what are the pros and cons of having a real tree versus a real tree? And I'm not going to get into all those, but anyway, there also, are a lot of pros for the fake tree. There are. Well, yes, because you buy it once because real trees. Now I remember I bought, I bought, I bought a real it. tree last yeah. year. I got it early on. I, I ended up paying like 90 bucks for the tree last year for, they you know, fantastic. for a month. They can get expensive. So yeah, you, you can also get the sticks to make it smell. Like a real tree, and you still get the nostalgia smell I'm going of a tree. To. I'm going you don't, to. No bugs in your house? No right. pine needles all over the place? I've heard horror stories that there'll be a little baby spider stuck oh, in a tree, yeah. and then they They're have babies, the and next thing you know, you're infested with spiders in your house. Happens all the time. Yeah, man. You're the taking all the nature in your house. Yeah, yeah they're, they're uh, they fall. Times. Yeah. They fall on little kids. Real trees fall and they're yeah. heavy. It's yeah. full of wood. They're, uh, so there's a bunch of cons to it, but I don't know. the. Experience. It's just authentic. And... The, the, the only pro that matters is that it's more authentic. I, I yeah. tweeted on uh, Tuesday night. I'm looking at the tweet right now. I said, I put up my tree and nearly all the Christmas decorations last night and honestly feel miserable about it. It felt premature, non-festive, and forced. No sentimental vibes whatsoever. Instant regret. I'll never do it before Thanksgiving ever again. What I will say, though, for the perspective is this is why I'm so grateful that I grew up in the Northeast and Mm -hmm. experience all the seasons, even though I bitch about parts of all the seasons. I think it's a really cool thing to live on this earth and get to experience the four seasons and the holidays that are associated to them and the nostalgic associations that go with it. Pat, you're a nostalgic guy, like being able to experience Christmas as though like the christmas movies display christmas with Mm -hmm. the like snowy uh chance at a white christmas that's fantastic i've been in the south during christmas time as you've lived in florida like that's a weird experience as people that grew up in the northeast to be see people out in shorts and palm trees decorated with lights like so we're also lucky to even have that experience of christmas in the northeast and and having a more traditional version of it i agree 100 percent i lived in Florida for five years and I always thought it was really weird. Now and it's I probably spent... harder to get real Christmas trees. Yeah. Think, well, they? Uh, they got, they got trees. It just, it felt cosmetic. It felt like I was in a, in a Disney movie in a way, the light, like where I live near Sarasota, it was, it was cosmetically gorgeous. I mean, lights yeah, everywhere, sure, yeah. festivals going on. It just never felt like Christmas. Cause to your point, when you it's, the chill when it's there, December bro. and you got a, you know, an old Navy t-shirt on and a pair of khaki shorts, how fucking Christmassy could that possibly feel? I agree with you for the most part about the four seasons, but what I disagree is I love Christmas season. I do let it snow, let it be cold. I'll deal with it. 
But in after Buffalo, New Year's, it's just awful. After New Year's, even a week or so, once it gets like to maybe the second from the second week of January, straight through to like say, say after Patrick the Super Bowl, once you're past the Super Bowl, nah, it's like, even right. before that for me. To me, that's not a season. To me, that well, unless you want to count misery, so there's a fifth season then. <laughs> Being cold and miserable. Once it gets to be early January through say St. St. Patrick's Day, where I start to me. Don't forget about if you're Irish or if you go out and celebrate St. Patrick's Day. To me, St. Patrick's Day symbolizes spring is really close. To me. Buffalo anyway. spring. Yeah, South right. Buffalo spring where it's like 50 and sunny. And <laughs> right. it feels right. like, oh my God, it feels like it's 80 out. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Another thing I want to ask you, because so you're out in the North Towns. Do you see deer a lot? You know, uh, not where I am. I'm pretty urban in my neighborhood, mm-hmm. uh, first ring suburb, like traditional first ring suburb, but we take walks, uh, or there's a cemetery somewhat in our area and you can walk through there. And almost every night in the summer, we see family of deer, uh, going through there and you see deer tracks and things like that. Right. Lots of Turkey too out yeah. there. Um, so it's not far from where we live. I don't know where all these deer live. Cause I've looked on Google maps. Like this, where is there a, like a forest? I know where they live. Yeah. They live near me. <laughs> but that's far. I don't like that's pretty far for deer to be up in a cemetery by my place yeah. and living out in some forest. It's got to be there's got to be more in like between me and the city of Tonawanda that I know. Yeah, sure. There's I, I took uh it took me a long time living out here in the suburbs and again, I've spent a lot of my adult life living in Lackawanna or Orchard Park and now West Seneca like borderline Orchard Park. I grew up on the West side. I don't think I ever, and I wasn't really paying attention to them. I'm not sure I ever saw a deer in my life growing up on really? the West side. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I say that because last night, uh, again, we're taping this Thursday morning, Wednesday night. I, man, I see deer. Look, there's three deer that literally live in my backyard. They sleep on my, in my backyard all the time. See them all the time. You see deer all the time, especially where I live. Anyway, naturally when you have deer and you know how they are they like to run in front of shit because they don't Ooh, have i just sense. had this conversation with my wife well last night i was coming home from work it was about and i stopped at uh wegmans which by the way i posted a picture on facebook i think i'm going to put it on twitter too literally empty shelves everywhere yeah. man no bread no rolls no i already had that stuff anyway i just thought it was i got a kick out of seeing that you know whatever anyway my point was this i'm coming up orchard park road near, near ridge going home and there's a, and I see two cop cars. I see cop lights up about a hundred yards ahead of me. I roll up there and, and this is not a fun story, by the way. It's not, there's nothing cute about it. This sucks. There was a deer like almost in the middle of the street. And I've never seen this before. I've seen, I see dead deer all the time. They get smacked by cars. I see them on the yeah. side of the road. It's common living out here in the South towns. Anyway, this time the deer was uh, alive. Yeah. Alert, head moving around. But it wasn't moving. It was like almost sitting in the middle of the street because obviously it's, it got hit by a car. There was a woman there on the side who you could tell her car got hit and the deer's up, legs were obviously broken, couldn't move. And there's two cops. And it's the first time I ever seen it. And then you kind of, you know, very slowly drive to the left lane to, to get past it. And it was almost like the deer was looking at me. And I'm like, yeah, this is fucking the worst, man. I, 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 I've never seen that, but a wounded deer. It's terrible. You know, it, it's alert. It's alive, but it's like, you know, it's obviously going to have to get put down because, you know, yeah. that's the right thing to do. Yeah. That just sucks. Deer man. are. It, it happens a uh, lot out here, man. Cars. I, I know a lot of people who have hit deer and their cars get yeah. fucked up, man. Whole it's Northeast, up. man. Maine is terrible. And there's sections of Maine where you're, you can kill multiple deer uh, if you're a hunter just because to keep the populations down. Because mm-hmm. deer can become infesting too. Like that's one thing yeah. that people don't realize. They're cute. Uh, but the thing about deer is they're, they're really absolutely freaking stupid. They're one of the stupidest yeah. animals in the world. And they will just, they freak out, they tense up and they run directly into traffic. Uh, What's this, the saying? It's called a, a deer stuck in deer headlights. headlights. Yeah. Like yeah. they just don't know what to do. Uh, where like, so my wife was saying she saw a coyote on the side of the road this morning on her drive in. She's like, I, all the years we lived in Maine out in like the woods and you hear coyote at night all the time. Mm-hmm. I've never actually seen like a dead coyote on the side of the road. And I, I told her, I was like, cause coyote are smarter than deer. They're not just going to run out into traffic. Right. Like, that's why you see it in this summer, dude, we were driving through Massachusetts. Traffic wasn't even, it was like pretty congested, congested and probably going at like 45, 50 on the highway and a deer was on the side of the road. And so everybody kind of slowed down and that little shit like ran right into the side of a car 
doing 45 and clipped it. And my kids saw it. And my, honestly, my six year old is like traumatized to this day. He still talks about it. He's like, Hey, remember when that deer got hit and it was just like, it couldn't move its legs and it was flapping mm-hmm. around. I was like, yeah, no, I get it. Like it's terrible to see. So it sucks uh, that we have built roads that cross right through where they run. Cause it's not a good mix cars and deer. Yeah don't play well together. I, I told my son, he's, you know, he's got his license now. He's 19. He's about to turn 20. I, you got to have your head on a swivel pretty much anywhere you're driving. You got to pay attention, where, obviously, but I don't know. In your here area, it's way worse in your area. I don't know if it's a thing where I grew up. Uh, they used to buy these little whistles that would go under your car. And they were like, as your car would get going, the air would go through them and it would make this humming whistle or whatever that you can hear. It's almost like a dog whistle hmm. that would keep deer scattered they wouldn't run towards it they would like flee away but i think in certain areas it's illegal like up here too you can't you guys can't have snow tires studded snow tires here right no nah, I, I don't know i think it's illegal know. in maine everybody has studded metal snow tires like with real metal spikes and you oh, put them really? on in the winter and yeah it i don't know anyone through the ice. It must be illegal here it's illegal here yeah I, i've never heard of the of the whistle thing either but yeah i mean he's there they just they especially again around the, this area you really got to have your head out of swivel. They just, they, they like to run through shit. And they it's do. scary, man, mm-hmm. especially at night, you know, it, it's just so wooded around certain areas. And I live in one of those areas where there's, I mean, there's lots of homes, but there's also lots of areas yeah. nearby that are, are wooded. And obviously that's where uh, a lot of deer save real quick too, before we get in the bills, I, I got to plug this. Um, I got a sub stack now. I don't remember if yeah. I told you this last week. All right. I'm anyway, sub. I'm, I'm kind of pumped about this, man. I've been putting a lot of work into this. I, uh, it's completely free. All you gotta do is put your email address, email address into a uh, subscribe. I'm putting up podcast clips from this show. I'm putting up all the full episodes from this show. I'm doing uh, movie reviews, TV reviews, wing reviews. Um, I'm going to start writing some random columns. This is more than just sports, man. This is like my fun, personal uh, content stuff. I, I really am getting a kick out of this and enjoy doing it a lot. Anyway, it's Pat Moran dot substack dot com i look you know i used to i so i've been doing this podcast now for a, close to five years i've i like writing i started this podcast because i got sick of writing i got i got was getting writer's block and i don't know it's just becoming a pain in the ass and i thought it'd be easier to start talking but i'm kind of going back to uh i don't want to say going back to my roots because again it's kind of like a newsletter just a, just a blog, but it's um, I'm finding myself having a lot of fun doing it because like this podcast, you got to have certain topics and guests for people to be interested. This sub stack I'm doing, I just write about whatever the hell I goddamn want to, man. And it's uh, it's been cool. And I'm starting to do Christmas mo- movie reviews. I, I, I think I mentioned this to you last week. You probably I know you've been busy and your week's been crazy. So you probably haven't had a chance, chance. to watch it. Yeah, yeah. Falling, falling for Christmas. When did that get released? Because <sighs> uh, this month. It's, oh, okay. brand it's a new, new one, new it's, Netflix. It's on one. Netflix, falling Man, for Christmas. some of those newer Netflix ones where they just push them out. I don't love them. There was the like a uh, couple ones over the last years, the Princess Christmas of Princess or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Those are terrible. It, this but... is a pretty good one, man. I, is I, it Hallmarky? Like... Yes, it is, but in a good way. In okay. a good way. There's one I, again. I'll it's check too it. new. I'm not going to spoil anything because it's too new. There's this weekend's the weekend for me to do it. My wife's well, gone. Well, watch this movie. There's one, pl- there's one plot point that's just utterly absurd and ridiculous. <laughs> but that aside, if you could, it's kind of like wrestling. If you could suspend your uh, your reality a little bit, you know, kind of treat it like wrestling, you, you really will uh, enjoy this movie. Lindsay Lohan, I, I thought it was a cute, charming movie, man. Check I got, that out. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Before we go, Bills, my tweet that got uh, attacked was Mariah Carey was trying to get the trademark of Queen of Christmas and it mm-hmm. was rejected. And my take is good. She's not the Queen of Christmas. Kelly Clarkson is. I think we've talked about this. I before. agree. And people I'm coming around it. with people you. hate it. Mariah's got the biggest song. It's Kelly top Clarkson is the best. And Mariah's song is only the biggest because it was released in 1994. So it's been in the social mm-hmm. sphere now for so long and it's been played on and it was when radio was at its hot, hottest peak that is how you got sure. your music was radio and so it's in there i was talking to riley reed who's a follower of mine on twitter he's uh, in the bills mafia twitter verse and he runs a radio station and he was talking about the data shows that people like the older stuff and now stuff from the 90s is considered older classic christmas but i don't i asked him i was like that's a chicken or the egg thing though because 
the newer stuff has to hit the radio at some point in order to become a classic. So if you're not actually playing the, like the new John legend that came out in 2018, like that was an instant classic that can go right into rotation of the old radio classic. So I think there's a disservice of radio not being necessarily the way it used to be, where that's how you got your music for these Christmas songs to really get the credit because underneath the tree can go toe to toe with Mariah Carey. Any I know you're going to say that. I agree with you. That's a good take, man. I actually prefer underneath the tree. It's I'll be playing. Song. I'll be playing that more this season probably than uh than Mariah. But I am not going to hate on Mariah. A lot of people hate. No, that song. she's great. I, love I don't Carey. hate it. It's a good song. It's and a good song. There's few things, at least uh, in recent years anyway, in this era that remind me of Christmas more than that song. Now I'm a, yeah. I'm personally a traditional Christmas guy. I like D. Mar. I like Bing Crosby. I I like right. the old Christmas music. But uh, yeah, I'm not gonna hate on Mariah. Okay, but I Mariah is one of my better. maybe top five female vocalists of all time. Like I love Mariah Carey. It's yes. not there's nothing against her. She's one of the I queens am. of R and B, but not Christmas. It's Kelly. One last question. I gotta yeah. want to circle back to something I had just talked about. I'll kind of tie it in. Your podcaster, you and Greg Thompson, you do the Cover One Buffalo podcast every, every week, week, twice a week during the yep. season. Um, what is your least favorite thing about podcasting? Like just being a podcaster or, or, or doing the podcast, is there something that is like your least favorite? I ask that because I have a, a, a pretty plain and clear answer. Do you have one? Does, yeah, I think like, from, like what's the biggest pain in the ass or the thing that you probably like the least about it could be something personal. It could be something about the show itself. Just something that the, you like the least about podcasting. For me, I think the hardest thing is I'm not, I'm not in this for, like clout or to get something for myself other than I just love talking about the bills. I really do. Sure. And I, it's something I've always, I'm, I have a lot of like peaking interests and hobbies and they're all kind of fleeting. And, but the bills is the one thing my whole life that I could go on 10 shows a week and talk about. So that's for me where it comes from. But in order to sort of do that and, and have it that successful, you do also have to, chase clout and do the things to grow your show and grow your presence. And I, I'm always conflicted in that of like wanting to gain a following versus just, I just want to do this because it's fun and I don't want it to be Mm -hmm. more, I don't want to be taken more seriously than I have to be. So I think that's the, the one thing that's hard, but in terms of the process, I really like everything. The, uh, the, I don't mind the criticism, but when people are a lot of, people are kind of mean like people try to seek you out and pick on you sure because you're on a platform and that's also probably my least favorite thing i would say and i agree with you on on your points mine is something i just talked about five minutes ago my least favorite thing about podcasting or being a podcaster or doing the show or whatever i hate i don't like having to self-promote myself you know that's one of mine kind of is too yeah if that makes sense like i hate I love the product. I love, I look forward to, for an example, doing this show with you. I love the process of putting, scribbling some notes together, which by the way, I rarely even tell Aaron what the hell we're going to talk about until we're taping. But anyway, I love just having conversations with you. Hell man, we've been going for half hour now. I haven't even talked about the bills yet. This part I love. I love doing the podcast. I hate the self-promotion. I don't like having to, to promote stuff like on uh, asking people to do stuff uh, like, you know, going on Spotify or Apple and subscribing, or like, again, if you're watching this on video, even though there's a little subscribe button right on the screen, I hate having to say, you know, two, three times a show, yeah, uh, give me sus- a review, make sure you subscribe on YouTube, like. give us a review, make sure you hit smash that like button, all that stuff. For some I people, you, it's man. natural. I don't like it. Like for an example, I was just talking about my sub stack and I, and I really like it and I believe in it. And I think it's going to be a really fun web page. I hate asking people, hey, go to my Substack at pavmoran.substack.com and hit that subscribe button, you know, stuff like that. It I works, just, though. It does work. It I works. Just... And you, if you're here's my thing where the rubber meets the road for me is I have this conflict all the time. And if if you're going to do something and you want to be good at it and you want it to be successful, do the things that are going to make it successful. And you're already putting yourself out there by making content, right? You're already exposing sure. yourself as somebody that's making content. So that takes a level of balls as it is, because a lot of people can hide behind anonymous accounts and trash you for being out there and putting your voice out there. But they're not going to be willing to put risk putting their face out there and having takes and doing that kind of stuff. And so if you're going to do and put all that work into it, I do think it's important to do it right and give yourself that platform. And part of that is, hey, guys, it'd be a real if you're a fan of the show, because people do. They'll ask us all the time. People really like 
the product we put out. And if they, if we miss a show or something, they're yeah. like, Hey guys, where were you? You know? And so people ask like, Hey, what can we do to help out? So that's why we have the cover one membership that you can do. Cause that does help keep our whole organization giving you the content you want. Right. And, and it is a hobby, but it's nice when you can sort of pay for some of the subscriptions and things that it takes. Cause none of this is free. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. And there's nothing better then when you do miss a show for whatever reason and you do have people saying, you know, what happened to Friday's episode right. or Tuesday's Everybody episode or something things. like that. That's all right, because we're going to take a real quick break and we're going to come back on the other side and we're going to talk a little bit of Buffalo Bills with uh, Aaron Quinn. Be right back, folks. All right, Aaron Quinn, cover one, casual Friday, taping this again, early Thursday. Don't know how it's going to be outside. when Still you're sunny. The sun's just shining through now. It is. It's almost eerie, isn't it? Kind of. I'm like, God damn, where's all this big snowstorm? Real yeah. quick, by the way, Shane's friend is coming in from Florida, and uh, they were supposed to go to Canada for the weekend and leave Friday to drive. That's not happening, so they had to cancel that. His friend is still flying in from Florida He's about to see some shit when he when he gets here late. It's like gonna Thursday. be an event. There's if, gonna be a snow if event. if the flight's not even canceled. And I also had a friend who grew up in Buffalo, so he knows this weather real well. But he lives in Texas now. He was coming up for the weekend to party and hang out. He had to cancel. He canceled this flight too because there's not going to be anywhere probably to to drive around and go. Anyway, all right. Let's I'm get looking right now. Yeah. Uh, the I use weather weather under weather underground and mm -hmm. for Orchard Park, which is where the game's going to be, mm -hmm. starting at seven p.m. tonight. It's going to start snowing like an inch and a half an hour. I'm working tonight for I'm, the first half. The first half is going to be fine. And I'll be outside driving a lot too. So the first half is going to be fine. I work seven to 10. I'm they're talking concerned about one inch an hour up to like one and 1.8, 1.9 all the way through till 5 PM. And then it gets to like just under an inch an hour for another. It's going to be an event. There will be a, a massive snow event if it's going an inch an hour or more. Uh, so I'm charging my bat. I got a little snow thrower charging my batteries right now. Hopefully, hopefully it takes man. Um, well, this could, you know, this snow could transition into Buffalo bills talk because the yeah. weather could be a factor to the point where there's at least rumblings going on that it, this could cause the game to be moved before we talk about anything else with the bills though. Yeah. So the bills have played nine games, 10 weeks. Uh, the 10th game yeah. is coming up. I should say the Sunday week against 11, Cleveland, yeah. um, week 11, let me ask you this. This is a pretty poignant point blank question because we've seen, which is expected when you lose a game, the way the bills did last week and they've lost two in a row. Now you're going to see, you see the highs of the highs for a lot of the year. Now you're seeing some of the lowest of the lows. One thing for the most part I like about you is that you are a pretty even keeled person who can keep their emotions in check when you're talking about the team. I appreciate that. At least how should, and again, this is just one man's opinion. This is going to be Aaron Quinn's opinion and nothing more, but let me ask it's, you. Which is truth and fact, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's fact. It's not opinion. My fault. It's true. Yeah. How should right now, Unamo, yeah. take the emotion out of it. Again, Sunday was a while ago now. The Bills are six and three. Um, there are reasons to be concerned, and we'll talk about a couple of those, but generally speaking, all in all, how should fans feel about the Buffalo Bills right now? Uh, I personally for me my expectations of this team has not changed it one bit mm -hmm. right like i think the bills by everything that i'm seeing um both in film and uh it, the data i'm a big believer in uh football outsiders dvoa if you watch our show i use dvoa every week to go through the matchup mm -hmm. so my process is every single week that drops on monday i'm scouring through football outsiders website to look at dvoa and i'm writing taking notes of hey they increased in this decreased in that what that allows me to do is go back and watch the film whether it's either condensed games of the opponent and then i'll pinpoint one game to try to watch all 22 or watch back on on coaches film and then i'm looking for what the data is telling me it doesn't match up with what i'm seeing and i see this buffalo bills team it's it's self-inflicted where the mistakes are coming from, right? They're shooting themselves. The teams that they've played, no disrespect to any of them, and they are good teams. They're playoff caliber teams. That's fine. But the Bills hurt themselves in every single one of those games and allow those teams to be in that game. And it really shouldn't have been. They're losing close games that they probably shouldn't be, and that is frustrating. And the way they lose sucks for fans. It sucks to see it, and it hurts. And then also to see those AFC East teams 
you know, Miami and the Jets right now being ahead of the Bills sucks to see. And you hate hearing mm-hmm. Nick Wright have to talk about that. But it's perspective, man. The season's about halfway, you know, like we still got some games to go here a little over halfway. There's a, we have a run of AFC East games coming up. It's all about getting right at the right time. And that's really all that matters to me. I said it last night. I don't even care about the one seed or not. And what I wanted it to start the year. Sure. That's cool. Go on a run, be undefeated, whatever. All those things are cool. But what matters the most to me is that this team is starting to get healthy at the right time. And they're starting to play their best football on both sides of the ball with balance going into the playoffs, because I believe firmly, this is still the best roster in football by a lot. I still think this is the best all around coaching staff in football. And I think once they get going, and I think they will here in December, it's a freight train that nobody wants. And if even if they're a wild card team, there isn't a team in the AFC that wants Buffalo running through their stadium in the playoffs if they're getting going and if they're healthy. And so that's where I'm at is my expectations haven't changed. And just real quick to finish the point, Pat, after this past weekend, with all the games accounted for, the Bills losing, the Bills playoff odds were still at 89% according to the New York Times playoff simulator. They still had a 25% chance at the bye, uh, and but they're 11% chance to be out. After, if they continued on a losing streak here, just to have some perspective, they could lose here to the Browns and the Lions I picked in this simulator. And they would still be at a 67% chance to make the playoffs. Most likely it would be a wild card team. And I would still take that team over the field in terms of who's going to make it to the AFC past the AFC champion, I would still take the bills. Vegas is still in on the bills. DVOA still has them as the best team in football. They just got to clean up these mistakes. And I think that we've seen them have bad football before, and we've seen them fix it. By the way, I, I, I should point out too, I'm looking at uh, Aaron's side. The bills are bad for my heart. If you're watching on YouTube, I will say this. And I, and I, and I told uh, my wife and my son this and, and my, my cousin who watched the game with me on Sunday, I said, if you were able to take out the emotion of, of rooting for this game and you didn't have a horse in, in the race, what a goddamn game that was on Sunday. I mean, God, just back and forth. It was absolutely insane. I tried, at least tried to take a moment to kind of appreciate all the craziness going on. Of, of course, I couldn't. I want to hit on, I want to focus on two major topics. So we'll do one at a time. This involves the Bills and some of their problems. Um, to an extent, you already hit on them both too. One of them is injuries. I want to pull up a tweet from our, 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 our good buddy. That's the wrong one here. I'm going to get the right one up. Where the hell is it? Uh, Bruce Nolan, our, our good friend, Bruce Nolan. He was talking about injuries. Okay. And I, yeah. I want to read what he said in 2021, the bills were second in the NFL in defensive D, DBOA on third and long in 2022. They're 28th, same coordinator, same coach lost three, all pro caliber players in the secondary. Right. Injuries are a problem for every team, but I mean, they've hit the Bills extra hard this year. You've had no Micah Hyde all season, um, no Trey White yet this season. Who knows what's going on with him and when he's going to be out there. No Jordan Poyer for four games, four of the nine games, which by the way, the Bills are one in three in those four games where Jordan Poyer has not played. Um, and that's not even to mention Matt Milano missed the Jets game, which they lost. Tremaine Evans yeah. missed the second half of this Minnesota game, which they ended up losing. Um Here- Phillips yeah, it, and Phillips and Oliver have missed chunks of the season, including the Miami game. Neither yeah. of them played in that loss. Um, how, how much is injuries a factor? Because I feel like it's finally, it has finally started to catch up to them. So I, I think with what Bruce is saying it is a huge factor in those situational, that type of situational football, right? Uh, it's unrealistic to think that uh, the fourth safety on your team, a guy that's a roster bubble guy, practice squad guy is going to come in and have the type of impact that a Jordan Poyer, the the hole that he leaves. I think DeMar Hamlin has done a nice job in that role. Me too. Overall, overall I think we need to hand so many more flowers out to Leslie Frazier. And I was actually really frustrated with Bill's mafia and my mentions this uh, weekend when people were attacking Leslie Frazier and saying the game's passed him by. He sucks. He needs to get fired that I've always been too high on him. I think it's disrespectful. I think Leslie Frazier is probably the one that has suffered the most from the injury bug that the bills have gotten and what he's had to patch together with a bunch of young players, new moving parts to this team. You lose your all pro safeties in a defense scheme that has been built around safeties, being able to disguise coverage and you replace them with guys that haven't had NFL experience. That's a huge lift. If you go back and watch the film of this game, Pat, 
the defense looked fantastic. And so the, what Bruce was doing, we had, we were having DMS. I was helping him get the data to look into what was going on because the bills are fantastic in almost every aspect of defense and DVOA this year. This might be one of the best defenses they've had in a long time, because you look at their PFF strength of schedule this mm-hmm. year, number one by a lot. Uh, so their st- strength of schedule so far with the record where they're at, has been the best in the NFL. So we also have to remember that, that they've gone through a gauntlet of games here to start the year, and it does ease up. The Bills' defense is number one in DVOA in the red zone. That's money, right? Like, that's the bend but don't break philosophy of this defense. They're number one in the red zone, third in red zone passing, second against the run. We hear that they're not a strong defense. They're not physical. You don't, you're not second against the run in the NFL in the red zone unless you can get down in the trenches. So this team is good. In the half splits, in the first half, they're ninth overall. In the second half, they're second overall. So Leslie Frazier is making adjustments. He's doing his job and making adjustments and getting better in the second half. This defense is number one in late and close games in the NFL. That matters, right? That's the knock on Leslie Frazier and Sean McDermott is that they're not clutch. The only place that they struggle, third and short, they're fifth. This team has been historically good on third down. It's third and middle. They're 22nd, third and long. They're 28th and overall on third down. They're 17th. And that's where Bruce Injuries got. matter. It's the, yeah, your holes into the middle of your defense and no Trey white. Like those things matter on those big plays, but they Leslie Frazier still had cam Lewis in position to make a play. And Justin Jefferson made a better play. Does Poyer break that up? I think probably does Micah Hyde. Absolutely. Right. Like, so you can still have players in position. I just want people to stop attacking Leslie Frazier because uh, he is not his fault. Cam Lewis is in there in the right spot and not making a play. I agree. And listen, man, I am not a, I'm not generally an excuse Ooh. maker. I know there's lots of teams. That was a good rant, by the way. There's there's lots of teams that uh, suffer injuries. Look at the Chargers. They've been crippled by injuries this season, but it is valid. I mean, you look at two of the three losses. You look at the Miami. I just think the Jets game. I think they took the Jets too lightly. The Miami game was definitely terrible. probably injury associated. How's the it most, not? Especially I mean, with the heat, the other issues that the Heat led to sure. for players that were healthy. There was no support. Like no, no rep, Poyer, right? no Phillips, no uh, no uh, no Ed Oliver, no Mitch Morris, no Dawson Knox. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of injuries. And then you look at this Minnesota game. And yes, and I agree with you. By the way, I think Demar Hamlin for the most part. Has been excellent this year. I mean, he's no Micah Hyde, but he's been. Not I yet. like. Him. Yeah, I think he's. I think he has. I'm very excited about Tamar Hamlin. I, I'm really I like him a lot. I, do I think not he's like Jaquan future... Johnson a lot. I do not like no, Cam no, no. Lewis a lot. But how many teams point. can sustain getting down to their fourth safety? This is what I'm Agreed. saying. Like it, it, the expectations within the fan base need to really dial that back of what you should expect out of that fourth safety when he's in. If I'm annoyed with the coaching about anything right now, it, it feels like why why is it taking so long? What like I feel like Dean Marlowe should have been playing ahead of Cam Lewis personally. I don't know why he didn't play. I don't I'll know pull why back. He I'll didn't, tell no, you. Go ahead. I'll tell you why. Tell uh one, we know uh I don't think he's up to speed yet. The defense, it has been two years since he's been here in terms of the communication. Communication on this team is super important in that back seven. That is how you operate a zone, is being able to communicate and pass receivers who are having option routes. So it's like a split second, second decision of who needs to be where. So there's a lot of communication, sort of a mesh. Think of like a constant mesh moving. Those guys need to communicate that. So he's not quite there, but this specific game plan, I think they wanted to run different types of coverages. And I don't think that they were necessarily, I think they were trying to stop the pass a little bit more with some speed where I, I do think Marlo will eventually come back in when it's more of a zone heavy, but they were doing some man, some zone concepts, different things. And I think they maybe felt better with Cam Lewis's ability to communicate right now. And that I do think he's probably a little bit of a plus athlete to, to Marlo right now. Um, but I do expect Marlo is probably going to start to get those reps. All right. Well, that's well, fair. actually poor, poor was practicing today. So it might be a totally moot point if he can stay healthy. Uh, that's fair. And, and, and it wasn't just, Cam Lewis playing safety instead of Poyer. I mean, that's the drop off is it's absurd, but it's also again no Trey White, which again they they've all season long they haven't had Trey White, so it's not like this is something new to them. But they also had no Kyrie Elam on Sunday. I thought Christian Benford played okay. I hate see stats could be deceiving. Like everyone's talking about, he had an interception. He had an interception on a ball that was overthrown by ten yards because he was beat by ten yards on that interception. I thought he had some nice physical plays, but I also think he made some bad mistakes, including a 
late hit out of bounds, personal foul and a pass interference, which to be fair, that was on Jefferson. But the personal foul was a bad penalty. But anyway, my point is no Elam, no Trey White, no, no Jordan Poyer, no Tremaine Edmonds in the second half of that game. That's a lot. So injuries yeah. are a legitimate uh, concern. Tremaine needs yeah. to start getting some love. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I, I was. I thought he sucked against the Jets. And People are still going to get on this, like, oh, he doesn't stop the run. He's no, fine. it was the Packers. I thought he sucked against the Packers, and I and I and I, and I called that out. And you know, it went it's as it's fine to criticize does. guys, but we got to pull it back. Is, but you're right because I I realize his value when he's not out there, just like I realize your employer's value when he's and not Atlanta, out there because you see right. the drop off. You see, not everyone can make plays like Poyer does or like Edmonds does. Terrell Dodson, all right, but. He ain't Jermaine Evans. Jermaine Evans would have made a play out of pass or two at some point in that second half. Or and this was a Kirk team Cousins that, wouldn't have been able to go to something. Yeah, he would have, he he would have taken did. a lane away. Absolutely. Yeah. So, again, sometimes you realize the value of guys when they're not there. So injuries are definitely a problem. And then the other problem is just turnovers. And, and for this, I want to read a tweet. And this one is from uh, Joe Marino. He put this, pointed this out earlier this week. The Bills have lost, or the Bills have three losses by a combined eight points while turning the ball over on 19% of offensive drives, by far the highest in the NFL. Your worry about the Bills should be tied to your belief that they can reduce the turnovers. They were middle of the pack in 2020 and 2021. Good point that I did not realize at the time. Uh, 19% of their offensive drives. That means pretty much one-fifth of the time that the Bills get the ball, they end up turning the ball over, which is it's dead last yeah. in the NFL. That's not good. Josh <laughs> Allen. Right. Six interceptions and a lost fumble in his last 10 quarters, four red zone picks in his last two games, um, and, and the fumble. Again, both losses. Slumps are slumps. All quarterbacks have them. I remember Mahomes had one last year. Sure. But uh, <laughs> what's the problem? Is he overthinking? Is he underthinking? Is he? I mean, a lot of people are saying too much is put on his shoulders. Is he trying to do too much? What, what, what do you forecast? What's the problem right now with Josh? It's, there is uh... a problem. The red zone stuff, I, I encourage everybody to go after this, after you watch this, go head over to the Cover One YouTube channel. Eric has put out a great video about just breaking down some of the issues in the red zone with some of the mm -hmm. play calling, some of the concepts, some of the spacing issues with routes. And you heard Patrick Peterson talk about a little bit of it this week. I sent you that clip. You sent me that clip. It was great. Some of the, yeah, they knew the concepts the Bills want to run and they, you know, Gabe Davis it, being limited in how he shows uh, certain routes and concepts and where he's going gave him ability to uh, know where the ball was going. And the, the thing that probably concerned me about that clip the most wasn't so much the Gabe Davis. I think everybody latched onto that because people are willing, unwilling to really have the honest conversations about Josh Allen, which he's a fantastic quarterback. He can play absolutely the most perfect football you've ever seen in your life that will maybe never, ever see any other human be able to do besides maybe Patrick Mahomes. But he can also give you the games in the quarters like we've seen here. I think he's more got a little bit more modern day Brett Favre in him than people want to yeah. agree with. And I think none of that matters if Josh is able to ultimately in some point in his career, get the bills to a Super Bowl and win a Super Bowl or maybe get to multiple and win multiple Super Bowls. Nobody's going to care about these crazy indie games where he fumbled it away. It's the winning will fix everything. If you talk to Packers fans from the 90s, they wouldn't have traded Brett Favre for anybody. But that's right. because he got them to a Super Bowl. He brought them back to another one. Um, and so historically, you look back on it with Vaughn, he's a Hall of Famer. And I think we'll be there with Josh, but he does have flaws. Everyone's got him. And his is that Brett Favre-esque where Minnesota's defensive coaches are saying, stay with him. Stay on your guys, stay tight because he's going to give you a couple opportunities in the game. And Josh played actually pretty fantastic most of the game outside of maybe three plays. He had a fantastic game for most of that game, but it's the two or three plays. If the defense stays with it and they know what you're doing and your offensive coordinator is calling stuff that's not totally new or you're not really working to your strengths, eventually the Bills are going to make a mistake and he's going to put a ball in coverage that's probably too tight and that another guy can make a play on the ball and it gets risky. The problem with Josh over the last couple of weeks is interceptions. Again, like I said, Christian Benford had an interception, but whatever. It was on a terrible throw, which kind of leads to what my point is. You don't see a lot of ones where Josh is just throwing it into the middle of the, like the Green Bay game, his rookie year. 
where he just threw one up, running across his body, throw it up into the middle of the field. Like the ones he's throwing, I could see the one in the Jets. You can't see the guy. Mm. He's putting some into some tight windows. Dude, I, he's not. I don't know, man. I, I look at all of his his six interceptions, all six of them, the totality of them. And I don't see, again, not all interceptions are created equal. Batted balls, a great play by the defender. I haven't seen a great play by the defender on any of these, really. They've been, well, maybe Peterson just making a break on the ball, but these have been gift wrapped interceptions. That's my Some, point. These yeah. have been, these have been pretty bad turnovers. The fumble, whatever, the fumbles, the fumble, shit happens. I, I, I really don't know. I guess the one thing I am concerned about is maybe, I don't know if this is Josh changing a play. I don't know if this is the coaches just not have, you got to be able to run the football to some degree in the second half. I look for I I brought up one play with Joe Yerden on Tuesday, which still bothers me, or one sequence, I should say. It was when the Bills were up 27-17, first down, eight-yard pass, to, uh, screen pass or whatever to, to Isaiah McKenzie. He gets eight yards. It's second and two from the seven-yard line, and I showed him a, a photograph. And I know sometimes images like, I know like Devin Singletary in overtime, if you saw on Twitter, it was cropped. It looked like there was nobody near him. That wasn't the case. He won't, probably only gets a couple yards if Josh drops the ball off to him, the check down. But anyway, in this case, Minnesota's in a six-man front. I mean, they got a six-man in the box. Four, four defensive linemen, two linebackers. Harrison Smith's a good nine yards off the line of scrimmage. They didn't blitz on the play. The Minnesota's pretty much begging you, say, hey, run the ball and set up first down and goal. But no, they threw a bubble screen to Dawson Knox on second, which didn't work. A slant pass to McKenzie, which was covered. And, and then the first of two interceptions. The Bills had to be able to run the football to some extent. Aaron, again, it's second and two. They score a touchdown, the game's over. I mean, it's 27-17. They score again. It's over. I don't know if that's on Josh saying, I don't want to call a running play coach. I don't know if that's the coach saying, I don't want to run the football, but I, man, when, when a team's, you got to take what they give you, you know, and Josh does that, but then he's getting a little bit greedy at times. And I don't know why, but it's like run think, the football. I was screaming when I saw that. I think they've had success in the first half of games running the football. I've, I really liked what we saw to Devin Singletary in that first half. I like Devin Singletary more than a lot of people do. And I think he needs to get closer to he's the first half guy though. No, I think if they got to get him closer to 20, 20 touches. I really do. I think he's got to continue. You can't take him out of his flow. And what happens is I think they are quick to go away from it. If they come out and there's a drive in the second half where one of those runs, two of those runs kind of stalls out, they get away from it and they go back to, which is understandable if you're a person who's had to do something like this, where you're in a game plan, if possessions are limited in a game, right? And so once you get into the second half, if you lose a possession, it starts to get a little bit of pressure. You're going to lean back into where's my fastball. My fastball is getting the ball in Josh Allen's hands and let him be the one that makes the play. My problem isn't a traditional run game necessarily. I do want more. I would like to see it more consistently. When we get into the red zone, my big thing has been, and maybe this is a simp take and a way oversimplification of how to play red zone football, but I have Josh Allen. I want to get him rolling. So I know he's not great to the left. I want to get him rolling either way, right or left. And I want to put defenders in conflict. I want linebackers in the NFL. I want you to make a decision. Are you going to come up and stop Josh Allen from stiff arming you on his way into the end zone? Or are you going to stay in coverage and prevent him from hitting somebody at crossing? And I would layer the crosses. I would have Isaiah McKenzie coming in low and somebody coming in behind him. Mm -hmm. like Gabe Davis coming in behind him, but give those guys space so that Josh is rolling you're stressing corners and linebackers to make a play. Are you going to try to tackle 200 and whatever pound Josh Allen, or are you going to stay in coverage because he can get the ball into tight spots? Those are the kind of those things I want. And then Josh has to have the ability that when all that stuff doesn't work and it's broken down and they have covered it up, right? Throw it away. There's opportunities here for Josh to just live another down. And that was some of my frustration in this game, especially with that late pick, the one to in overtime to seal the game. You had time. Yeah. There was no need. No pressure. To, there was no pressure to make that play. And in those moments, that's where I need the maturity to step in. And I made an analogy this week of my kid. Uh, he's not potty trained. We don't have diapers anymore in the house. He's peed the bed twice this week. And that sucks. It really right. does. I'm, I'm super mad. I've been doing laundry all week. I'm frustrated with him. Why are you doing this kind of? And that's where I'm at with Josh Allen. I still love him. Like, I still love my kid. I'm going to go pick him up. I love him. Hug him. Uh, I still love Josh Allen, but it's okay to be frustrated that he has pissed the bed for the last 10 weeks. Or 10 I, agree, I agree with you about Devin Singletary. I'd like to see him more involved. And 
I mean, he did fumble in the second half. Maybe that played a role. The Bills' last 24 plays, two of them were were run calls. And this is with them having a lead until the very last five plays of the game. So that was frustrating. Devin Singletary did have two red zone touchdowns in the first half. Yeah. Again, that was a drive. The, the the interception to Peterson in overtime to end the game pissed me off. I agree. Josh got greedy. There was other, he should have lived to fight another day. I agree. But I'm more mad that that game got in overtime because there was a sequence of about maybe 20 different plays where if they make one play, it never gets there. Um, anyway, that's old news real quick. Cause I know we, we got to get out of here. We're yeah, on a pitch count. Aaron and I are on a pitch count when we do these shows. Um, the Cleveland game Sunday. I don't know why. I'm a little bit worried, man. Yep. I, I was two weeks ago against the Jets, too, but for different reasons. I thought the Bills were going to sleep on the Jets, and they did. I didn't think they were going to lose the game, but I was, I was worried about it. I think Cleveland's not – they're a tough matchup, man. Yeah. It, it reminds me of last year's matchup a little bit with Indy. I, I think Buffalo was better than Indy last year, but just the matchup itself, the Browns can run the ball, Nick Chubb's a beast, pretty good yeah. offensive line. I know sure. they've been shitty against the run. The weather could kind of be uh, – a, a, a big factor in this game, man. By the yeah. way, one quick thing: any chance you think if the weather's really bad that the Bills might play it safe? Uh, maybe you don't even see Josh Allen. You think that's a possibility? Oh, I don't no. know. It's unlikely, but no, I think Josh goes. I think where you would see is I don't think Tremaine with a groin would play, obviously, right. and then uh, it might delay the return to Trey White. Uh, in a situation like that, like I could see if it's slippery out. Here's my thing about this matchup, man. I spent a lot of time on the Browns this week getting ready for it. And I said it on our show, it's not even about the other team. I don't care who is lining up against the bills this week. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it, Pat. They got to fix their own shit and get it right. And now's a good time to do it. The Browns are still, they don't have a legitimate quarterback. They have a good offense. They're sixth overall in DVOA right now. They can move the ball. A lot of that's run based, but their passing game has some things that can do things to you. But ultimately you're a better team. You have better players in mm -hmm. all three phases of the game. You need to start winning these games that you're supposed to. You're still an eight and a half point favorite. Go win by 10. Yeah. You know, put this game away, show everybody you are who you say you are. Now's the time to get it right. You got Cleveland, the Lions, and then you got a three game stretch coming up here against your division. You got to get right going now. Just start rolling. Be the freight train everybody expects you to be. Clean up your own act. I don't care who it is. I don't care about the Browns and what they can do. They every team's got somebody. Every team's got a Miles Garrett you got to account for. Every team's got some playmaker that can bust the game open. That can't be the thing that beats you anymore because that, those things only beat you with teams that have limited versions of those. It only works if you beat yourself. So don't beat yourself. Keep the pedal down and put this team away. I agree 100%. You know, and weather has been, it's going to be extreme Sunday, or at least there's a good chance. Josh is be. weatherproof. We've known this, this. Has been, well, this has been a problem though for the Bills in, in no. the last couple of years. It was a problem last year, the win against the Patriots. That was only so a problem in that Miami. Game, that win, win game was only a problem because the coaching staff didn't trust Josh Allen. In right. the second half, we, we had to start throwing because the game was already done. He proved that, hey, we could have done this the whole game with some level of success more than the Patriots. And I think that they knew that at the end of the game and realized they made a mistake because I do think Josh Allen, his abilities, the way he runs, the way he throws is always going to be better than the guy that's lined up across from him in whatever weather situation it is. It might get sloppy for him, but he'll be that much better than the guy lined up across from him because what he can do. I agree 100%. And by the way, get ready on Sunday for a lot of uh, stupid dome weather tweets because I no, promise God, you that's, it's already coming up. that's going to be coming a lot on Sunday. I don't think this game is going to get moved to Detroit. I know there's been buzz that about that. I will tell you one thing. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a little bold prediction. I know that they can't switch the game to Monday. I wouldn't be surprised if they push this game back to like Flex maybe four, four or five o'clock. They can't do it. I don't think they can do it at night because, again, the Bills play Thursday. But don't be surprised if this becomes goes from a one o'clock game to maybe a four or five o'clock game. Give them a couple extra hours to get that stadium in a, and maybe the field in order. That could happen. I wouldn't be surprised about that. Nothing will surprise me anymore, man. Uh, re real quick. So no metal stand this week. We'll do that next week again. I wanted to talk Christmas stuff and, and, and things like that. Actually, it'll be two weeks when I have Aaron on next week's Thanksgiving. So he'll be enjoying that with his uh, family. I will do my this week in random um, bobbleheads, though. Recognize this guy? Coy Wire, baby. Coy he's Wire, bald now man. like me. <laughs> he's, on, he's on the shelf. I like Coy Wire. He's a pretty cool safety, man. Yeah. But anyway, thanks, guys, for listening. Make sure you follow Aaron on Twitter. Check out Cover One Buffalo Podcast. Blah, blah, blah. I told you about this promotion stuff. People already know that, man. They already know to go check you and Greg out, man. Come on in. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing the pod. Again, I won't talk to you next week on the show, so have a good Thanksgiving to you, You man. too, man. Happy holidays, right, buddy. Talk to you guys soon. Take care.